welcome students, ladies and gentlemen. Let me introduce to you our next talented, super creative, well-known key speaker, our dear Dr. Jason Kennedy from Auckland University of Technology. He is known by his high quality work as a curriculum leader and animation pathway leader. He is a senior lecturer, a specialist of animation, visual effects, and game design. Today, Dr. Kennedy is going to fascinate us with his expertise during this lecture named Practice Based Strategies to Support Scientist Visualization Through 3D Animation and Beyond. Dr. Jason, the floor is yours. You can get started. Thank you very much, Masha. Um, I am just going to quickly um, well, actually, no, I'll introduce myself now before I try to share my screen. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I am joining you all today from Auckland, New Zealand, which means that I am uh, in the past, actually. Is that how that works or am I in the future? I, it's never clear to me which part of the world I am in. I'm either in your past or in my future. It's not clear. Um, and so as uh, as I was introduced, yes, I am the curriculum leader for the animation, visual effects, and game design major at Auckland University of Technology. Um, I am, I've been working in this field for about 20 years now, and uh, my area of expertise is uh, in animation, but specifically within um, acting for animation and acting for motion capture. But I also have a background in science, and that's one of the reasons why science visualization is something that appeals to me very much. And I am increasingly uh, bringing my research into that area as well. And so this has been a very good opportunity this year to work with uh, Arvinda and Majda to um, create this beginning exploration of a project that I'm going to discuss with you today. Uh, so let me just quickly share my screen, if it will give me that option. All right. Um, Oh yeah, and I just talked about myself, so I don't really need to go into that. I guess the only other thing on there is the fact that I am both a, an animator and an actor, and that's where I have this sort of creative nexus between acting and animation within my research. So um, if you were to look at most of the articles that I've written to date, they are within that realm. But now, especially with this project, I'm moving more into the scientific visualization realm, not as a replacement, but as uh, as something that sits alongside the kind of research that I've already done. OK, so ultimately in trying to yeah, try to figure out figure what out I am what talking I'm about today, uh, I wanted to think about who is my audience. And my audience was a kind of a combination of potentially scientists, potentially students, maybe some designers in there as well. And so in terms of um, deciding how to phrase what I'm phrasing here. I couldn't just put it from one angle, and therefore I decided that I would try to make it a little bit more all encompassing so that if you were a scientist, this would be of use to you. If you were a designer, this would be of use to you. Um, or if you're neither of those things and you're just kind of interested in how do we approach uh, making interesting visualizations, and of course this will be of interest to you as well. So just as a very basic overview of what we'll be looking at, uh, begin by defining the scope of our project, and we'll go into details with each of these different sections here as the presentation unfolds. So what exactly needs to be made and for whom? Then we'll talk about communication. How do you as a scientist talk to a designer and how do you as a designer talk to a scientist? How do you translate between each other? Because you don't necessarily speak the same languages. And I don't mean languages like, um, Sinhala versus Tamil. I mean, like the same languages in terms of uh, the language that you have in science is something different from the language that you have in design, even though you're speaking technically in the same actual spoken language, right? And uh, then we'll talk about the documentary example that I've been working uh, with uh, Majda and Aravinda uh, so far. And uh, that's a Pleistocene project, so sort of what we kind of just called it, takes place in the Pleistocene essentially. And then uh, we'll wrap up by taking a look at some other forms of scientific visualization and sort of where is scientific visualization likely heading. Okay, 
So we'll begin by defining the scope. A key thing to think about, and this is something that a designer would always think about, is what are you trying to communicate? If you're a scientist and you have a specialization, you probably know your research inside and out. All right, you could talk about it all day. You could bore your entire family with it. Your friends probably don't want to hear you talk about it anymore. But when you are trying to convey something to somebody else, what is it that you are specifically trying to get them to understand? What is the specific message you are trying to get out to them? And that means that it's not all the information that you have in your head, it's a specific quantity of it. And which information would communicate more clearly in a visual form? So think about whatever your scientific project is. Obviously, there's a lot of data there. There's um, a lot of theory probably underpinning it. But which things primarily hold up well within a visual medium? Because if you're getting a designer to create a scientific visualization, then of course it's going to be a visual medium. So in general, the things that hold up well there are trying to explain difficult concepts, for one. Um, large data sets or comparative analyses, those are things that uh, computers are really good at processing, but they're, you know, our human heads aren't so great at holding all that data and understanding it at one time. Um, mapping change over time, seeing how things evolve and change over time. It can be very uh, persuasive when shown in a visual way. The very big or the very small or the very old, those are all good things, like the very big at the astronomical scale, right, or the very small at the atomic scale, or the very old at the paleontological scale, if you will. Um, so those are things where we can't normally engage with them in our everyday lives. And so therefore, uh, what will be, you know, the scientific visualization rather, will be our main touchstone to engage with those ideas. And then something I put in quotation marks because uh, some scientists and some uh, teachers view this as a pejorative term, but edutainment. The idea that we can have education and entertainment at the same time. Ultimately, scientific visualization does go a long way to making sure that what is being learned is also being enjoyed in a entertaining way. So to begin with, we have to think about who is your target audience. This is exactly what a designer would be thinking about. So it's important that as a scientist, you think about this as well. Your target audience is of course going to depend on the, uh, on the type of publication or visualization that you're gonna be creating, right? If you're creating a journal article, your, your, your uh, target audience is going to be obviously probably other scientists. But if you're creating something that is a documentary, for instance, then that's probably not specifically scientists who are gonna be your target audience. So when we think about this, think about the target audience and their existing knowledge of the subject. How familiar is your target audience with your subject already? And how do you get them on your level? You have specific things that you want them to know, but you know, it's interesting today, some people have a lot more knowledge about things than they used to, but then sometimes we assume people have knowledge about things that they, they don't, right? Um, and then we have uh, intrinsic bias. How does your target audience think, right? Where are their intrinsic biases? Do they have an epistemological bias? Do they have a technological bias or a political bias? All those things can impact on how they respond to your message. They might have barriers in place that make it more difficult for your message to get through to them or to convince them. So how are you going to tackle those or at least respond to them? You can't just assume that your message is so persuasive on its own merits that you will overcome somebody's intrinsic bias. That would not be a recipe for success. Learning preference, right? What medium and what kind of style appeals to your target audience. How can you design? How can you present for that? So are they people who like things that are in just uh, plain images? 
Are they people who like things that are in a YouTube video? Do they like to watch stuff on TV? Would they like to see it in the form of a movie? Would they like an interactive graphic? Would they like, you know, there's all these different kinds of media that you can potentially produce, but it comes down to understanding your target audience well enough and maybe doing some research and a designer can help you do that to understand what is the best way to convey it? One of the things that was very popular, for instance, at the beginning of the 2010s was companies uh, would decide that they have a product that they're trying to sell. And everybody thought that they needed an app because apps were new, newish, at least at the time. And it seemed like apps were the thing that everybody was doing. So companies would go to a bunch of interaction designers and say, build me an app. And the interaction designers would usually take their money and do it, but nobody really stopped to ask the question of, is an app the right thing for your product? And in many cases, it wasn't. You can have an app, sure, for your company, but that doesn't mean that anybody's going to really want to interact with it or even understand your product better or, you know, engage with it to maybe buy it, for instance. Uh, that's, if you if you don't have that right, then your, um, you know, your time is is sort of wasted in a way. So we want to make sure that ultimately uh, what you're uh, what you're doing, the way that you're targeting yourself and the way that you're marketing yourself, because ultimately this is a form of marketing, you are marketing an idea is being done as effectively as possible. So what is the core information or idea that you need to communicate to your target audience? And think about this. How does that challenge the existing worldview that they have? Right? Do you know what their existing worldview is? If you don't, it pays to figure that out. How likely is your target audience to then embrace the new knowledge that you are going to give them? Are they going to resoundingly say, yes, I am convinced. Thank you. I will never look at the world the same way again. Or are they likely to, you know, run you out of town with pitchforks and, you know, flames and tell you that uh, never let your shadow darken my door again? Or are they more likely to sit somewhere in the middle where they're like, hmm, interesting, but I like what's already familiar to me. So even though what you said sounds kind of persuasive, I think I'll stay with what I already know. And that's the more likely scenario because that, that's a sort of pattern of behavior a lot of people have. So how likely are they to actually embrace the idea? And therefore, knowing that, how can you package your ideas to make them understandable to your target audience and ultimately, hopefully, get them to embrace them? So the idea of packaging these ideas is a lot to do with obviously the medium that you present them in and the and the visual style that you use, but also the language that you use. How accessible is it to them? Does it answer questions that they would normally just automatically ask? So, you know, if you can if you can uh, preempt questions that they would ask, then great, do that. Present that as part of the visualization, as part of your message figure out what those barriers are to getting your message across. And then also ask yourself, and this is an important and often overlooked one, how do you, you feel about your target audience? Do you have an opinion about them? Are you biased for them or against them, right? And how does that bias factor into the way that you have constructed your message? So, What's always a good thing is to try to put yourself in the shoes of your target audience, right? To empathize with them because empathy is so powerful. And empathy means to be able to see and understand the world the way that they understand it and not to apply judgment in that moment. Maybe you don't like them for whatever reason, but can you understand why they think the way they do? And in turn, you're trying to bring them to your side. You're trying to get them to uh, grasp and understand um, and adopt whatever scientific idea it is that you have, right? Obviously, we've seen a lot of this in the past couple of years with messaging around uh, the pandemic and people, some people look at the scientific messaging as unreliable or 
quote unquote fake news or a variety of things for a variety of reasons. And then there are other people who look at the data, understand it, have, make a make a very sort of um, pragmatic kind of response to that and do their best to follow the messaging that's been put out there and, and to uh, quell those uh, mixed messages. So if you are trying to get out good data and a good message for the pandemic response, for instance, and you have a bunch of people who are just saying back to you, oh, that's just fake news, or that's just um, something that uh, you made up, or uh, you know, your opinion as a scientist is just as valuable as my opinion as a insert whatever job you want to call them. Um, well, that's a problem for you to figure out how to how to get through to them. And a designer will help you with that to the best of their ability. Different designers can do that. But uh, you have to try to first figure out why is my target audience thinking the way they do? And that can be very difficult, especially when it's very different from the way you think. So what are the barriers to your target audience understanding your ideas? First, knowledge, sure. Does your target audience have inadequate knowledge of the subject? Or is it that the subject is too complex for the target audience? In many ways, no subject is really too complex. It's just in the way that you present it that it might be. Uh, does your target audience have a particular disability? You know, for instance, if you were making a message specifically for people who were blind or deaf, um, a, you know, a visual message for people who are blind is probably not the best way to go about it inherently. Um, so is your message accessible to the abilities of your target audience, right? And so it could be things like attention deficit. It could be, you, you think about it. There, if you can think about a disability that is specific to your target audience, um, good to plan for it. Now, that might not be the case. Not every target audience is going to have disability as part of their um, makeup that's worth thinking about. Uh, technological is a very important one because this is something that's very uneven around the world. Is your, tech, is your target audience able to access the right media and the right devices to receive your message? Right? Do they have uh, enough bandwidth? Do they have access to the internet? Do they have um, hardware and software that will run what you are trying to get out to them? Is it reliable? All those sorts of things. If it's not, then is that the right way to get that message to them? Socioeconomic, right? Are there social or economic factors in the life of your target audience where they feel that those socioeconomic factors are more important or more immediate than the message you're trying to get out to them? I mean, one of the troubles you can have with trying to convince people of climate change and the effects of climate change is, if they're struggling to get food for tomorrow, they're not going to really be worried about whether or not the food comes from a source that is detrimental to uh, our climate, ultimately. So, you know, we have to think about that too and plan for that. And then philosophical barriers. Does your target audience have a belief system that runs counter to your message? Okay. Um, I left this as philosophical because it's it, it could be any form of thinking, but if I'm being honest, it's it most often for, falls into two categories. One is either a religious belief, and the other is often a political belief, something to do with nationalistic ideas or uh, religious ideas. It's not limited to not, not limited to those two, but most often probably falls within those two categories. It's important to understand and ask whether that philosophical idea for your target audience is negotiable, however. Are they so entrenched into that idea that they will never change it? And if it is, if it runs counter, then how, you know, how are you going to get your message through that? But if it is negotiable, then how do you make them negotiate that? How do you get them to give a little bit? Take a little bit of your message, right? Let that sit in there and maybe 
make them think differently about their philosophical basis. Mark Twain, a very famous American author said, I like a good story well told. That is the reason I am sometimes forced to tell them myself. Ultimately, everything that you're doing with scientific visualization is about telling a story. And what is the story you are trying to tell? Every story breaks down into some form of a beginning, middle, and end, right? These are the touchstones that your target audience will use to understand and engage with your scientific ideas. Something, you know, with the beginning, some, this is the way things are. In the middle, this is the way they develop. In the end, this is the, this is the climax or the conclusion of what has happened and changed. And ultimately, we basically look for what has changed from the beginning to the end. People tend to grasp concepts more easily when they're communicated in the form of stories. That's just the way we are. We're a very narrative kind of uh, people, or narrative kind of species, that is. Um, and sometimes stories are imperfect in the way that they convey a message, but they can be more memorable and they can make the message more understandable. Stories are generally best when they are clear and where possible when they are simple. Now, of course, if you're trying to explain a very difficult concept, it can be difficult to make it simple. But can you simplify it in some ways? What can you let go of to keep the meat, keep the, the essence of what you're trying to say without necessarily getting bogged down in all the details necessarily? Because that might not be that important to your target audience, but the core message might be. And the design layout is fundamental to story clarity, especially when you're communicating something in a visual way. Now, you might wonder why I have what I have over here on the side. Well, first off, the first image at the top here is just some design principles that are visually laid out to kind of represent what they're about. Um, the idea of line, color, and texture, and size, and space. The idea of being able to make things clear and easy to understand and to navigate your eye around the visual space to ensure that the message is understood instantly, clearly, and in the way that you intended. And the image that I have below that is one example that I found when I looked up um, examples of bad design. And why is this so bad? It's, it's bad because, uh, first off, where does your eye begin here? Okay, probably Fast and Furious. That's where my eye begins. It's, a, it's the most dramatic thing. But then Fast and Furious 3K, okay, I, I still don't know what this is. And then where does it go? $15, 8 a.m., I have still no idea where, what it is. Stay for the car show. Oh, it must be a car show. Okay, um, where next? Beachside Studio presents for info call. What is it? It's register at something, can't read it shootrunning.org. Oh, it's a 3K race. It's not anything that I thought it was. And my eye has been led all around this image in no meaningful order. And the order in which your eye traverses through an image or through a visualization is very important because that's how we, how we understand things. It's how we make meaning is based on the order in which we see things. So um, this is a, an example of what I call somebody who knows how to use Photoshop, but doesn't know how to design. All right, and then they're two different people. <laughs> uh, lots of people can use Photoshop, but that doesn't make them designers. And being a designer would mean that you are able to produce an image or produce a visualization that people will understand the message and get it in the right order and get out of it very quickly and understanding of what it is that you're trying to convey. Jeff Herman, lead data science instructor from the Flatiron School says, the first thing you should think about is that data visualizations are not for yourself, they're for others. When you are, as a scientist, asking for a visualization to be created to represent your data or your science or whatever it is, it's not for you. 
You already know this stuff. It's not about whether or not you like it and think it's perfect for you. It's about whether it works well for the other people who you are trying to communicate your idea to. And if it doesn't work for them, then you have to figure out a way to fix it. So just because it works well for you doesn't mean it's going to work well for somebody else. You already know too much. You know too much about what you're talking about. Of course, it's going to make sense to you. You can fill in all the blanks. But when somebody else who doesn't know anything about what you're talking about looks at it, are they able to fill in the blanks? You have to be able to lead them. It's your job to lead them on that story. So data visualization provides us with some really great ways of being able to understand complex amounts of data. Like for instance, how many people are alive by a particular age group over any period of time and how is that changing over time? Now, if we just look at an Excel spreadsheet with a whole, whole bunch of data in it, that may not, an image may emerge in your mind, but it won't emerge as quickly as this wonderful graphic here from the Pew Research Center, which is looking at the percentage of the United States population um, by age group, and specifically that darker brown section there are the baby boomers. Those are the ones who were born um, around about 1950 to 1960. And how many of them are alive and um, still part of the population? And what percentage of the population do they uh, are they at any given time? And so, of course, as we can see here, going from uh, 1950 to 2060, um, we can see this wonderful sort of shrinking of this very wide band that started out. The baby boomers in the United States were significant because they were like this all of a sudden, there were all these extra people who were born after World War II. And they continued to exert influence, obviously, in a, in a political fashion within the United States, and they're getting older and they're going to have to be taken care of and all this stuff, right? So the... Um, this kind of graphic does a really great job of being able to convey that message very quickly. Here is a, um, a, a recording, uh, well, not recording, sorry, scientific visualization of uh, a money concept, basically. And so I'm going to play this, and I think it's a really well done representation of uh, a financial concept. And of course, again, this is a, this is an American thing. I didn't choose it because uh, I'm originally from the United States, but I chose it because it's a really good representation. And even though it doesn't necessarily pertain to to you if you're not from the United States, uh, it's a great representation of how we understand data. I'm just going to mute myself while I do this. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution. And 92%, that's at least nine out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart, but the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than nine out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind blowing. So, that is uh, you know, a bunch of statistics, basically. And if you just say it to somebody from a statistical point of view, they may not really grasp it or care, even if it affects them a great deal. 
But if you can take them on a story, which they've done here, and they've done it very well and made it very clear what you're looking at, uh, then you can be very persuasive. And now this data was from 2012, is 10 years later now. I don't think it's gotten any better. So it'd be interesting to see how much worse it's gotten since then. All right, continuing on. There's now, as I mentioned before about the uh, about a whole bunch of companies wanting to make apps to sell their products. Well, the problem in that case was they didn't know what the right medium was to essentially uh, advertise their business. And so you have the same uh, problem, right? You have a scientific idea and you have a target audience. What's the best way, what's the best medium to convey that message? So obviously we have websites, right? Create a, a really nicely designed website for people to come and read. Social media, you can have social media presence. Um, perhaps you're deciding to publish it in uh, a periodical, so like either a newspaper or a magazine or or something that's nice and glossy. Could be in the form of a press release that you hope gets picked up by the you know by a, a television station, or you know some press releases can get picked up by a variety of different media outlets. You've written this press release, so you hope it's persuasive. You're kind of like writing writing the news essentially creating a scientific impact through writing the news that you hope somebody reads on the news uh it could be writing a book you know is it a is it a book for children is it a book for a uh, non-fiction book for adults is it a uh, scientific uh you know edit, basically an edited journal kind of book sort of thing is it you know think about who your audience is for that is it like a documentary or a film Right, that was obviously within the project that um, we were working on. We, the initial idea was to create it as a documentary. Um, a, a conference, of course, very traditional, at, or publishing it in a journal, again, very traditional for scientists, but each one of those has a different uh, audience that participates in it. So if I want to get it out to people who are not necessarily that engaged with my subject, I'm certainly not going to put it in a conference or a journal. Right, I might do that supplementarily for my career, but not to engage with my target audience specifically. So they might be more likely to engage with it in social media. If they don't have access to that kind of technology, then you have to think about maybe there's some kind of um, some kind of political action impact sort of thing on the streets kind of thing that can be done as well. There's different forms. And then of course, importantly, is what is your budget? You you have to make decisions based on your budget and you, you have to be very honest about that. So in a lot of cases, your budget is none or small if you're lucky. Um, a lot of times we're we're a lot of times we're spending our own money to get this stuff out. And that's not fair, but that's just the reality of it. Uh, occasionally, if you're at some kind of um, research institution and you have a you've, you've established yourself well in your career and you're adept at writing grant applications you might be able to get to the more medium area that's where you're getting money that's kind of more in the well i'm using i'm going to use figures that are akin to new zealand dollars but um roughly i guess if i was saying uh, I, I don't i don't have off the top of my head these values in in um sri lankan rupees so um, I apologize, but thinking along the lines of somewhere in the in US dollars as a sort of a, net, a worldwide kind of standard metric, um, probably something more like between five thousand to a uh, hundred thousand dollars, right? Uh, that's sort of medium. And big, of course, is anything more than that, where you're getting into the millions, hundred thousands to millions. And so big is usually when you have um, either very good grant or you have some kind of commercial funding, right? You have some commercial client that's coming in that is wanting to invest in you. Um, so if you have very little money and you're in the none to small category, then obviously you can't hire people or not hire really experienced people. So you might have to work with less experienced designers. Sometimes working with students and interns can be very helpful. People who are at the beginning of their career. Um, you may not have the money or the time to create your own new assets. Uh, the, the, the visuals, the, the, the actual 
um, design of the visuals or whatever they are, you may not have the ability to create your new ones. So you might have to see if you can find some that already exist that you have the rights to use or that you can retool in some way. Communication in this case, the quality of your ability to communicate your idea is more important than it looking like it's it's uh, got this beautiful shine to it, right? So um, thinking about where do you put your where do you put your balance of of importance? It's on the quality of the communication when you don't have much money, and it's likely it's going to take longer as well, right? People who are working for free aren't as incentivized to work fast, or they may not have the experience to work as fast. Um, if you are working, if you have a medium budget, obviously you, you kind of sit in the middle between the two. So let's just talk about the big first. So if you got all this big budget, right, you can hire the best of the best. You can hire the experienced designers. You can get a professional narrator. You know, um, you can develop your own custom assets. You can have this big broad scope with memorable visuals and you might you might even be able to get it done relatively quickly relatively of course being the operative word but if you're you know you're more likely to be in the none to small slash medium category at some point in your career so medium is not a bad place to be you, you sort of hire a mix of experience maybe you can get one or two experienced people to work alongside several less experienced people you might be able to develop some custom assets where necessary and then be able to repurpose other ones like you would have in the smaller budget category. It's a good idea in this case to strike the balance between having a clear message and polished visuals. How much polish can you afford essentially? Never sacrifice on clarity, but how much polish can you afford? And you might have a more negotiable turnaround. It may not take as long. When is your deadline, right? That's a key factor. It's a key thing to know and to be able to communicate to the designer. Your deadline and budget will play key roles in determining the visual strategies and overall quality that can be achieved, right? If you want it tomorrow, I can't do the same kind of stuff that you I could do if you gave me a month or two months or six months, right? Depends on how how long you have and it's important to realize too that there will be a series of uh iterations that you go through so it's not just going to be all of a sudden you get it and you're like oh my god it's perfect i'm so happy it, it, that just never happens you know so there's always going to be some back and forth and the designers are aware of that so be clear with your designers what you want to achieve including your time frame and available budget so that we can agree what you're able to afford both in a in a financial way and in a, in a time way ask your designers for a range of visual strategies that they can provide based on that information and what are the benefits or challenges of each of those different strategies and very important here is to negotiate how you will communicate and provide feedback to each other the what we don't want to do is to have is for you to just say oh yeah go ahead and make that thing and then they work on it for six months and you get it and you're like oh that's not what i meant All right and can you just make this change well that that change that you're requesting now was something that was decided on in week one of that six month project which everything else was based on so you know now you're essentially back to the drawing board so it's important to have frequent check-ins. It's important to have that kind of back and forth communication, making sure that things are working, right? How will you quality check the results? You determine a system and you schedule to review the work in progress. And that's an important thing to keep in mind is like, if you're gonna review the work in progress, are you able to? Do you have the necessary hardware and software and time to meaningfully review that work? Are you Are you ready? as the scientist to come to the table with the designer to make sure the designer can get their job done effectively to help you. So it's also very good to agree upfront about revisions because this is at my experience working as a designer. I used to work in the jewelry industry as well, is that you get um, clients who will want to come back for 10, 20, whatever number of revisions and every revision costs you time and it's work, right? 
And anytime that you're working on that revision, you aren't working on something else that could actually earn you money, right? So it's important that you agree up front what a maximum number of revisions will be included in the cost that you're paying for beyond which any extra revisions would incur a set cost. It's just important to create that that negotiation up front, right? Um, and that will mean that there's a lot more trust, I think, between the designer and the client, which is the scientist in this case. Another great question to think about is how flexible are you with the results? Scientists want precision, right? We want to be able to take the ideas that we know the data supports and unerringly communicate that data to our audience because we care about that data. Getting that refined data was a lot of work. But is it necessary that in the communication to your specific target audience that you are 100% precise? If you are 100% precise, then every detail you're communicating is scientifically correct. You can feel assured about that. But it potentially comes at the cost of communicating it in a form of a compelling narrative. And that compelling narrative might be the reason why your target audience remembers and engages with and is affected by your message. Are you able to maybe be not exactly precise, but very close, what's called accurate, right? Um, which means that you're scientifically correct, but some details may be missing or glossed over to create a better story. Or maybe you're more in the idea of being an inspirational kind of person. You're trying to inspire people. And while you have the science in about 80% of the message as, as, as reliable, some of the ideas may have a few liberties taken with them to craft an engaging story. Obviously with, a, with paleontological um, television shows, there's a lot of times people who have ideas, hypotheses that they're sort of testing out visually and people are responding to. And then, you know, watching people re re reply to those uh, visualizations, you hear the science never supports that. So-and-so said that this was not possible, et cetera, but it made a much more interesting story it made people interested in the subject, right? Jurassic Park was never about being a scientific visualization specifically, but it did inspire a lot of people to become interested in paleontology, right? Um, so it wasn't, you know, we're not trying to use that as an example of, of, of science being taken to the masses, but it, and the, and the amount of science that was correct in that was far less than 80%. Um, but the, the point is that at a certain point, you can use story to your advantage to help get people interested in a subject that they may otherwise not engage with. And that is a first step. And if you can get them on that first step, maybe you can then get them on the journey to engage with later uh, aspects of your research that is more accurate or even precise. Okay. That was the first part there. So communicating between scientists and designers. So be warned, the greatest time and cost in projects is often poor communication and unrealistic expectations. And a lack of clarity is costly, right? It's graphic here, it's great graphic, it's the most expensive words in production. I'm not really sure what I want. Just keep showing me things. I'll know it when I see it. Well, Everything that I make or show to you costs money, costs time and money. Okay. If you have a good plan up front, you save a lot of time and money. So first off, you need to establish a common language. Scientists and designers tend to think and communicate in ways that are different from each other. So what, what assumptions do scientists make about designers? And vice versa, what assumptions do designers make about scientists? What is the language of your field, right? How can the scientist make it clear to the designer and vice versa? There is a language in your field. You have a lot of terminology in your field, right? Um, 
your field has specific words that you use, probably very scientific sounding words. Maybe you have words that we use in everyday language, but you use them in a specific way within your field as well. So how do you make sure that your designer understands the language that you're using, right? Um, and then likewise, the, the designer has um, specific words, right? You know, within within the world of 3D modeling, I can talk about um, I, I can talk about um, UV layouts and retopologization and ray casting and you know all sorts of things. And then if that language doesn't make any sense to you, I haven't communicated to you what those words mean, what that language is. Um, so it's just as it's just as uh, kind of archaic sounding coming from me as it would be the scientist speaking to the designer. So a good way to ensure that you have understood it as well as possible is to ask yourself after talking to the designer, for instance, would you be comfortable going back to your team and accurately describing to your team what the designer wants using the designer's own language? using the words that they've communicated to you. And likewise, if you're the designer, can you go back to your design team and communicate to the other designers what the scientist wants using the scientist's language? So until you can do that, you're probably not really speaking the same language. It takes a lot of time and investment, but it's important. So agree on concepts and terminology, right? Scientific terms, clarify all the definitions and concepts that you are going to use. Guide the designer through the field. You gotta get, you gotta bring your target audience through the field anyway. So first up, try doing it with the designer. It's a dress rehearsal for your target audience. Identify what about your message is most important for you. For the designer, clarify all the jargon in your in your field, right? Guide the scientist through what the design process is. It's the it's your methodology, right? Establish meaningful expectations of what can be produced. Your scientist is used to watching movies that have a production budget of two hundred million dollars with twelve hundred people working on it, and they expect that they you can do the same thing by yourself for less than a thousand dollars. So what is that? Is that a meaningful expectation? Of course not. So it's important that you help them to understand that what you see in a Marvel movie is not the same thing as what you can get when it's just one or two people working on a small budget kind of project. Okay. So also as a designer, identify what is most important for you. That might be understanding like the, the way that you are going to engage with the project. Understanding design pipelines. The designer should carefully educate the scientist on the design pipeline that will be used in the project, right? Confirm the appropriateness of the design approach for the given project. That way you can make sure that what you're intending to design for the scientist is going to lead to the result that they want and that they, are, they understand the steps along the way. And that helps to manage expectations. It helps for you to outline specifically what you're going to do at each step. Because for most of what you're doing, the scientist just thinks it's some kind of computer wizardry. And they usually just think that you're just pressing buttons and things are magically happening. Now, of course, you as a designer know that's not true, but the scientist doesn't know that, right? Make sure you tell them how much time is associated with each step. It's a very time consuming process. We spend it alone in rooms by ourselves, so people don't really see what we do as clearly, uh, but it still obviously takes up a lot of time. And then identify where there are potential bottlenecks. That could be in terms of communication. It could be in terms of, I need this part of the project to be done before I can move on to this part, All right? If you got a parallel process, where does that break down, okay? So as an example, this is a um, this is the creature design pipeline that we're using for the project in the research that we're doing right now. Right. I'll come back to this and talk about it in a little bit. But first, it starts off with concept design. It moves into uh, creating the model and then it branches out to a different possibilities of 
creating uh, coloration for the model, creating articulation for the model, and then putting all the pieces back together and then animating the creature and then finally creating the finished look, right? So I will take you through that in a moment. Another example is a visual effects production pipeline for integrating a digital creature into a live action film, right? This is uh, using a variety of different software. And you see, it's not just a single thing you work with. Uh, there are a variety of different uh, pre-production strategies that you go through that lead to uh, different ways of visualizing the project up front, right? So some of this goes into the more story story world. Some stuff goes into simulation testing early on. Some of it goes more into the filming side of things earlier on. Um, some of it then in a parallel process, um, we have modeling and, and coloration and, and articulation that's going on earlier. And eventually it all gets put back together and we get delivery at the end. But breaking this down and understanding it is something that is sort of second nature for a designer, but not necessarily for the scientist. So it's the designer's job to make sure that it's clear and that they also understand if it's necessary for them to understand what kind of um, you know software is being used. And that might come down to a matter of budget. If something needs to be purchased, they might ask, well, is it necessary to use that software if we're only using it in this one stage, for instance? Maybe it is or maybe it's not, but that's for you to describe to them as a designer. This is a very rough, very, very rough approximation of how much time you would expect proportionately for each step within the process that I'm doing for this project to take, All right? So the concept design of things, roughly 10%. Then modeling, 15%, texturing, about 15%. Rigging, which is where you create the armatures that uh, move your model around, allows, uh, which allow you to animate, roughly 20%. It's quite a complex process, actually. And animation is the, is the big one here, roughly 30% of the time, maybe even more. Um, and then finally, putting it all together and making it and in, in, in creating that final look at least 10% of the time, maybe more. All right, it's a little bit hard to say because it's very dependent on the project, but this is a very much a rough approximation. So a designer should give you some kind of idea like this based on the project that they're doing with you, what they think it will be at least. So design changes. Well, remember that since any point within the production pipeline is dependent on the preceding steps, design changes become increasingly more costly the later in production that they occur. Late game changes negatively impact deadlines and the quality of the result and often increase the project cost beyond the planned budget by a great margin. OK, so now we get into the actual documentary example. Sri Lanka is home to a variety of fossils from the Pleistocene epoch. Um, so we're looking at specifically somewhere between 11,700 years ago and 2.58 million years ago. These include many large terrestrial species that became extinct during the most recent ice age. And several of the extinct species that were endemic to Sri Lanka have not had their visualizations updated since the 1950s. And so this was a, this project allows us to create much more uh, modern understandings of these creatures. So the initial intention of this project was for us to uh, create a documentary film that was going to integrate 10 extinct Sri Lankan species into live action backgrounds, very much like Prehistoric Planet that I'm going to assume many of you have probably already seen, um, where you have what looks like a live action background. You have a very realistic looking creature in, uh, engaging within that environment. It looks seamless. It's a nice high level kind of production. Uh, it was a very large and ambitious goal and the first thing that I try to figure out when somebody proposes this is how am I going to manage it? What are their expectations? And so one of the first things I asked was, how long is the documentary and how much of that time will there be uh, animation, basically? So we're looking at something between 35, 45 minutes, somewhere in that range, and roughly maybe 10 minutes of that would be animation or have animation in it. And then my next question was, 
of the 10 minutes of animation, how much of that is unique animation and how much of that is recycled? Because if you watch a lot of documentaries, what you'll notice is that oftentimes they will have these sequences that they keep repeating over and over again. It gets very belabored over time, um, very noticeable, but it's, it's there because it's, it's costly. It's very costly to, to produce animation. So they, they, sometimes what they do is they just repeat it, but then they, they've like inverted it horizontally to make it look like it's new. It's a stupid trick, but it works. Um, and so the, uh, so we're looking at maybe somewhere in the realm of about five minutes worth of, of unique animation. So about five minutes repeated of the five minutes that's unique. And so that now I'm like, okay, well, this is more achievable. Five minutes is still a very big ask. A uh, professional animator, by the way, somebody who works at like Pixar or Industrial Light Magic or the top, you know, the top kind of animation studios, um, they might make at most in one year, two minutes worth of completed animation. All right, that's, that's their production in one year. At most, two minutes of completed animation, and that's considered to be quite a bit. All right, um, so it's a very slow process, okay? And that was them just animating the animating characters. That wasn't them modeling them or coloring them or rendering them. That was just them moving them around. Okay, um, so all this a whole bunch of other people are involved with the rest of that aspect. So it's a very co uh, it's a very cooperative and co time costly kind of operation. So also in the consideration of managing this project, we have to think about what's the budget. <laughs> None, <laughs> basically, um, or very little, right? Um, the fact that I'm in New Zealand and uh, Arvind is in Sri Lanka, Majd is in China, um, and anybody else I'm dealing with, you know, we're in different places. So how do we make this work, especially when we have to deal with like live action backgrounds and all this sort of stuff? Um, and then what is the available hardware, like the computers usually, and, and uh, cameras and such like that, of software? and the creative talent. So most of the software and creative talent and computer hardware is gonna be on the New Zealand side. Um, but if we're working with live action backgrounds from Sri Lanka, then we have to have people in Sri Lanka film those. So we have to have creative talent on, on that end with cameras and, and other equipment that's necessary to film that. So that on location filming requires you know, particular skills. And I needed to make sure that the people who would be on that end knew what I needed to make it work. Because if you send me footage back and I look at it and I say, I can't use that because I, it's missing elements that I would need in it to make my, my project side work, then you'd have to refilm it and that's gonna be a problem. So I'd rather make sure everybody's really clear up front what, what I need as the visual effects supervisor so first off, we would find out what kind of cameras are available. Are they, are, are they good enough, right? We, we figured out that we had a solution for that, which was good. Um, I had to provide some film, film guidance for how to create usable plates. By a plate, I mean, the, it's basically the live action background that's been filmed. Um, HDR gathering this high dynamic range imagery. That's when we have uh, an image that has a whole bunch of lighting information in, in it. Some of you doing photography may be familiar with HDR, um, but basically how do we how do we get those images and how do we also do motion tracking on set? This, uh, this chrome ball here is one of the ways that we um, can shoot uh, for high dynamic range imagery, um, as well as also get on the matte ball over here, a sense of what the overall um, uh, sort of glossiness is on the day and, you know, a lot of this stuff helps us to figure out what was the exact lighting on set at the time of the shoot so that we can recreate that in the software. Logging shot information, somebody's going to be on set to make sure that they take down all the information that uh, was being used so that we can use that again to recreate it in the digital realm. And then, of course, location and weather considerations. Obviously, weather impacts things greatly. If it's raining, 
you're not going to get a good day unless you want it to be a rainy shot. You probably don't, though. Location, what are the what kind of considerations are you going to have? I mean, if you're shooting in a bog, um, that's probably going to be difficult, right? Um, if you're sh if you're shooting in an area that's got uh, you know a mountain and you know there's a lot of health and safety issues around that, how are you going to do that? So things to think about. Okay, so we are creating photorealistic digital versions of extinct species. Some of the trouble, of course, is that we have limited fossil evidence for many of these species. Also, the existing paleo art is, in many cases, minimal, uh, old, and lack important details. Right. So this is an example here. This is um, of the the elephant Paleoloxodon nematicus. Um, that you know, this is from this is this was published in um, the monograph that uh, that that Arvind put forth. And recently, and you know, I looked at this and I thought, hmm, okay, I can see some stuff, but it's very much like a line illustration. It's not showing me a lot of the textural detail of the creature. Um, I don't see the whole creature. I see just this head, right? Uh, so there's, there's, and the fact that this here looks a bit different from this here, and, you know, like, oh, what am, what am I trying? What am I looking at, right? Um, so. I, you know, I want to go and, and figure out how do I how do I make this as accurately as possible, but I need something to work from too because I'm a visual person. So planning, modeling, texturing, and rigging 10 species to be scientifically accurate is a significant undertaking, and that was the original scope for the project. And that's the case even when you are working with experienced 3D artists. And while I'm an experienced 3D artist, I don't have a whole bunch of other experienced 3D artists at my disposal. What I have are students who are studying this field. So they're they're early in their experience, right? There's a lot of stuff I have to teach them still or oversee. Um, so yeah. <laughs> um, but fortunately, within um, my program at uh, my university, we have a requirement that all of our graduating year students do an internship. And I was able to make it so that this project could function as an internship with me in the role of a visual effects supervisor. Um, so I looked for a range of skills uh, among students across our three pathways, the pathways being animation, visual effects, and game design. Um, and students who specifically wanted to work on particular skills or develop new skills uh, could get involved with the project. And I put everybody together and we've, we've been working inside of Trello as our main um, uh, project management software and uh, just sort of a screenshot of you know, some stuff going on within there. Uh, so, you know, a way to keep the project going ahead. And as we are working toward a high end product, we do need to work with advanced software to achieve the outcome. So, you know, the actual software is rarely uh, as important as a lot of people make it out to be. Somebody looks at something nice and they say, oh, what software did you use to make that? It's, it's never the software that made it. It was always the designer that made it. Software is merely a tool, but uh, for clarity in terms of the project that we're doing, what I am working with is Autodesk Maya. It's our principal 3D software. That's what you see over here in this image. Um, Maxon ZBrush, you know, just just until recently it was Pixelogic ZBrush, but Maxon, the company, bought up Pixelogic. Um, and ZBrush is a high-res 3D sculpting software. Adobe Substance Painter uh, is a 3D texturing software. Arnold Renderer is our high-quality rendering software. Uh, Adobe After Effects is a layer-based compositing software, and the Foundry Nuke is a node-based compositing software. And again, this is where I could use, explain the language of my field to kind of communicate what do I mean by layer-based versus node-based and what do I mean by compositing, but it's not entirely relevant to the discussion at the moment. Um, so what is important though, is that our students are trained in the software, which is important in terms of minimizing the amount of time spent on new skill acquisition from the design team. Um, it helps to establish consistency with the Sri Lankan team if they have designers who will contribute to the project so that they know what what they are expected to work with. 
uh, so that we can create a consistent software workflow between the Sri Lankan and New Zealand teams. And it's very important for us to agree on a design ethos, especially in terms of creating a final look and quality of animation. I want to make sure that everybody's clear about what I expect in that regard and how that is influenced by what the client or the scientists expect as well, who are in charge of the project. So when we think about our budget, it's kind of here. It's between none and medium, right? Um, and that's because I have been able to get some money from my school to pay for uh, some things, basically some, to, to pay for some um, assets to be as a starting point. And uh, I can potentially get some more. It's not a lot of money, but we just have to be smart with our money, right? Um, and, and figure out how to make that go as far as possible. All right, so how do you work within our budget specifically? Well, work with from some existing assets as a starting point. Purchase high quality royalty free 3D assets that can provide a good starting point for modeling. Maximize your value. So when you're buying those assets, look for ones that have good topology. And that, that basically is how well, how, how good is the layout of the, um, of, of the polygons on the surface of the object? That layout, the quality of that layout determines how well the model will deform and therefore how well it will animate. Um, so look for assets that include good topology that already have textures, so you don't have to make them yourself. That's the color, like the color information. Um, ones that maybe already have some fur grooms. So like if you got a tiger, it already has fur as opposed to having to make it yourself. Uh, and some that might already have some basic animation that you can use, and some do, right? So that the, the ones that have that may cost a little bit more, but they will ultimately save in production time and money. And then um, not everything that you buy will necessarily have a rig created for it, or the rig that it comes with may not be uh, ideal. And so the rig is how we move the character around or the creature around, it's how we, how we actually animate the creature. Um, so in that case, we need to uh, create a rig. And creating rigs is a very slow and time-consuming process. And it's very technical. So to speed that up, I have uh, a trusted auto rigging script that I work with. Um, it makes it very quick to generate and edit the creature rigs. And they're all kind of based now on the, every creature will be based on the same rigs for consistency for the animators to understand. Um, it just makes it a lot faster and easier. Right. And as we are working toward this documentary, of course, uh, some political difficulties this year impacted our progress and uh, things didn't necessarily turn out the way that we expected. So we didn't uh, you know, wave a white flag in defeat. Instead, we say, well, what can we do with what we've already done so far with the goal later on of still completing this documentary in 2023 or, or whenever, but keeping that one as our, as our ultimate goal. So um, the idea now is, can we take the visualizations of the four creatures that we've uh, produced so far and use them to support, uh, you know, visualization of uh, within like journal articles uh, related to those species, All right? So we're looking more at uh, still images right now than we are about creating a, a documentary, but this is a nice, it's going to be a test run essentially. So the pipeline that I go through here, um, I will lay out for you, then I'll show you where we what we've gotten to at this point. And like I said before, a knowledge of software is not the same as a knowledge of design, right? Anyone can, anyone can learn a few basics of how to edit images in Photoshop, but that doesn't mean that they understand good design practices. That Fast and the Furious example that I showed earlier is a prime example. So it's important for non-designers to understand that what 3D artists do is not button pushing. I think a lot of people just think that there is such a thing as the make it look good button. And if you just press that, you're done, right? Uh, that's not the case. We use software as a tool, just as a sculptor uses chisels and hammers and polish to reveal the form. And it's a very long and intensive and uh, artistic process. All right, so within this creature design pipeline that I mentioned before, let's take a look at it. The concept design side of things, what does that look like for this project? 
Well, um, it takes in several different forms. There's some scientific research that begins, obviously. What does the fossil evidence reveal about any given creature that we're working on? What do ecology and comparative anatomy suggest? So if we're looking at animals that are alive today that are similar to this to the species or live in similar ecologies, what would that suggest about where the extinct animal, how they might have lived and what they might have looked like? Reference gathering. Uh, that's where we would compile examples of species from existing paleo art um, of what there might be. Some of these species don't have much in the way of existing paleo art. Or we might source photographs or illustrations of similar living creatures. Anatomy studies are really helpful because we look at the anatomy or physiology of similar living species. It helps, that, helps us to understand very likely how the anatomy and physiology worked of the extinct species. We can also study the details of the skin and scales and fur and all that. Look developments where we create mood boards of creatures that uh, are alive today, existing in similar environments, enacting similar behavior, just gives us some reference to look at and put them together in the form of a mood board so we can kind of see them all at once. I'll show you some examples. And image planes. This is where we draw the creature in a neutral pose in matching views from uh, what we call an orthographic side view or an orthographic front or an orthographic top view. The orthographic basically is the opposite of perspective in this case. So two line, two parallel lines in an orthographic viewport never converge at infinity, right? In a normal viewport, uh, two parallel lines always converge at infinity, but orthographic basically means there is no perspective, it's just flat. All right. The scientific research. Well, within what's been discovered in Sri Lanka of Paleoloxodon nematicus, for instance, we're not finding giant fossils. We're finding uh, much smaller examples, right? We've got some teeth, right? Primarily teeth. Aravinda can chime in here and tell me if I'm completely wrong on this, but uh, we're not finding like this big, beautiful uh, head. This is, uh, you know, this, this is, um, a, a, from a different find, essentially, from a different uh, form of research. But we have found examples of Paleoloxodon nematicus uh, elsewhere. So we can use that to guide us, fortunately, right? So within reference gathering, when we're looking at, you know, what kind of paleo art is out there, some people have come up with their own depictions of Paleoloxodon nematicus, right? Um, some of these may have license taken with them, so you have to be aware of that. And they may have been produced at different times. So the science that underpinned them was a product of its time, and you have to be aware of that as well. But it's still there. It's still important to look at. The anatomy, right? Well, um, I can get a nice detailed view of what the likely skeleton of nematicus looked like. I can look at the muscle layout of a modern African elephant and say, well, that's probably pretty similar in many ways. I would expect similarities. Um, I can look at fine details of things like the, the skin wrinkles and the coloration of the eye and the, the um, nature of the eyelashes and all that. All these are things I can put together as part of my anatomical study. Uh, these are the mood boards, right? The look development. This is where I might say, okay, what does it look like for elephant, you know, African elephants to uh, be journeying across the savanna? And I could have a whole bunch of those here looking at different behavior, looking at different family units, um, could have one of more uh, uh, extinct species of, of elephants that um, have diff obviously many different physiologies. Um, and then I have a few other ones of, um, you know, Asian elephants, for instance, in different environments. And we'll come back to these ones in a moment. Image planes, all right? This is where I said we had those orthographic viewports. Right, image planes are ideal when they are created from the front side and top views. So a, um, an image plane is where we are trying to take a, a character or a creature and present it flat from side, top, and front. And the reason for this, if you notice, is that they all align perfectly. All the details here align perfectly. And this makes it much easier to 3D model this creature when we bring it into software to do that. Uh, so image planes are our way to quickly um, to, to speed up that process and to make it more accurate. 
But sometimes we don't have a nice flat image to work from, so we have to work from what we get. And uh, this was a sculpture I was sent um, by, uh, by the team. And from that, I used it as a basis to create uh, just a side image plane of uh, what would become uh, Rhinoceros cagavena, which is one of the extinct species that we're working on. It was not 100% accurate. Uh, we figured that out later on, but it was a starting point. Some other image planes, for example, that I've worked on. This is a, uh, this is a dinosaur guamong. I did this one last year. You can see this one gives us all three, fortunately. Um, and uh, this, is, this one is for a, a, a character. It's not even a, it, it's a, it's meant to be a meerkat character, a very skinny meerkat character is on the verge of death. Um, and, uh, but again, image planes have a very important influence on our um, ability to model something. All right, so modeling, let's talk about that real quick as we move forward. The, um, the modeling side of things is um, very important in this case because we have to make sure that the, the creatures are uh, of a high resolution and, and accurate. So to save time, we purchase some high quality 3D models that are similar to our creature as a starting point that we can modify. So we look for files that include textures or rigs and animation already, like I previously mentioned. Then we will go through and digitally sculpt those models to match the shape of the intended creature that we're trying to create. And we wanna make sure that the, uh, the, the mesh, that's the geometry, has good edge flow, that's the topology that I mentioned, and it deforms well for animation. And then we also wanna make sure that all the smaller details like wrinkles and scales and pores are well represented and that as the creature deforms, um, it, uh, we, we can control this deformation through some more advanced things like blend shapes and pose space deformers, but sort of outside the scope of um, the talk right now to go into what those exactly are. So. As a starting point here, um, I went to a site, it's very common for my field called TurboSquid, and uh, there were some models that were good starting points, right? Did a lot of the work for us, which was great. I remember we said, we're working on a small budget, so we gotta make the most use of our time and money. Um, obviously this one here, Paleoloxodon Antiquus, it's not exactly the Nematicus, but very close, right? Uh, this one here, the Indian Rhinoceros is a, very close relative to uh, Kegavena. So that works out really well. Um, modern Hippopotamus works really well for Hexaprotodon, Sinaleus, that we are working on as well, right? So those are good points. Obviously they cost money, right? And this is where some of the funding that I received came into uh, account. So the model as purchased, the Paleoloxodon Antiquus, uh, it's an extinct creature and this is it after I have gone through and done a whole bunch of extra modeling on top to make it look like Paleoloxodon nematicus. Obviously there's a relationship between the two, especially in the rest of the body, but the head especially and the tusks are quite new, right? So it reduced the amount of time that I had to spend on the modeling side of things. Same thing is true here. Uh, this is the Indian uh, rhinoceros, Rhinoceros unicornis, uh, which is still alive and um, Rhinoceros cagavena, which is the one that we are using as part of our um, documentary, right? This one already had a lot of nice uh, texture detail, so that saved a lot of time as well. Now going into the, uh, what we call the texturing side of things, uh, this is where we're dealing with things like color and surface properties of our creature. So to be able to, um, take our creature and, and, and be able to store that texture information, um, we can't just do it in a 3D model. We need a flattened 2D version of it, all right? And that when we take a scalpel to our to our creature and like lay its skin out flat, that map or that, uh, that layout that we create is what's called a, a UV map uh, or a UV layout. And carefully laying this out is a technical and artistic challenge you need to do it in a way that um, doesn't cause distortions in the, the color imagery, for instance. And then color and texture data is stored in a variety of image files, which we call maps, to control aspects of surface properties, um, things what we call like albedo, specularity, normal, subsurface scattering, displacement, right? Albedo is like your, is like your color without any highlights or, or shadows. 
If you just got a strict color of, of your face without any highlights or shadows, that would be your albedo. All right, specularity is like the, the way that the light bounces off the surface of your skin um, to generate highlights. Sometimes they're sharp highlights when your skin's oily. Sometimes they're flat highlights when your skin is nice and dry. Okay, and materials. So when you adjust shaders that control how light interacts with the model's surface, all of the image maps uh, link to the shader to produce the final look of the creature for rendering. All right, so here's our here's our uh, pneumaticus, and this is with the UV layout on the side there, where it's nicely laid out in two dimensions. And our maps here, we get the diffuse color map, that's basically our color, and the roughness, which is um, how uh, how shiny or how uh, matte is the light at any given spot on the character's surface. Put these all together inside, uh, this is inside Maya, in what's known as a material node graph, where we uh, link them all together into various different channels inside of a shader. It's all technical stuff, um, but we put it together to make the final look, right? And then within the rigging side of things, we, like I said, we use that um, auto script. Um, it, for us, it's uh, Rapid Rig Modular. Uh, that's the name of the script. and we do that to create a flexible rig for the model, which allows us to customize it as needed. And then once you have that rig, it doesn't automatically just move the model around. You have to um, go ahead and um, deform. You have to basically show it how to deform the rig. Um, and so that's really uh, a process of what's called painting skin weights. It's a very complex, uh, time intensive process that some of my students got uh, heavily into this past year. All right, um, so you know, beginning with that script, we get some where we just call the rig proxies. Um, they eventually get turned into joints, which are the things that move the, the geometry around. In order to move the joints around, though, we create some additional controls so that we're not moving the joints directly. There's reasons for all that. Um, and that creates for us the full animation rig now. I know I'm running low and short on time, so I'm kind of going a little bit faster here. Um, and then skinning the model is where we try to assign any given joint to an area of vertices to influence only that area so that when we move the rig around, it moves in the way that we would predict. All right. Finally, putting things together here in Maya is where we start to put all the stuff together that we have so far assembled. Um, this is the full scene set up with all the files linked in Maya. And then we start to animate, or in this case, pose our Creature. So this is our pneumaticus. Um, I have uh, two different photos here that I was working from. Um, this one here with a with a daughter and father riding the back of an Asian elephant, and this one is just with an elephant in the grass. And I wanted to see how closely could I replace these Asian elephants with um, the the model that we have here and make it look as believable as possible. So we posed to them to match more or less the pose that uh, was in those uh, photos to begin with. And then we went into the rendering and compositing side of things. All right, so we have to set up a whole bunch of lights. Each of these little rectangles is a light. Um, and it's very controlled lighting. It's not just like putting one giant light in the scene. We have to go and make sure we're getting the highlights correct and everywhere. Um, it's very complex. And, you know, I was working with my students as well. This is me giving them a whole bunch of notes saying, look, here's where you need to be focusing your time and attention. Um, it's not looking right yet. Pay attention, damn it. <laughs> and um, we worked with a little bit more advanced form of rendering called uh, additional output variables, which or AOVs, which allow us to separate the different parts of the render into different components like the albedo and uh, the diffuse and the specularity. So this would be the normal raw render. And as you can tell, that doesn't look that great. It kind of looks like a video game. But if we can separate out those individual elements, we can control them a lot more inside a compositing software. This is inside Adobe After Effects. So this is what the raw render looks like. But if I go through and I control each of those different elements separately, I can now make it look a lot more realistic. And that gives me uh, full image control. And this is now, just for the comparative, this is kind of the, the, the climax of the presentation, really. This is the reference photo of the Asian elephant. This is now the version where we swap out the Asian elephant for the Paleoloxodon pneumaticus, right? And that's at the same scale. 
That's a 2.5 meter shoulder height. So before and after, right? So the lighting is very similar. Um, overall, it's a pretty good result. I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, the only trouble with it is that Paleoloxodon nematicus was much bigger than an Asian elephant. So this is what it would actually be like if it were in the same scene. A very large creature, it's a 4.5 meter shoulder height. Uh, so uh, it gives, this is kind of cool now, the scientific visualization allows us to really be able to understand just how big these creatures were by comparison to uh, existing creatures. Uh, we have this one here, right? Um, so let's replace this elephant with Paleoloxodon nematicus. There we go, all right, same scale. Pretty good integration. And what about at its correct size? Boom, it's a big boy, all right? Um, and so, you know, this, this is a test run, right? This gives us a sense of how well will this work for the documentary in the end? This is just a still image, but we can kind of get a sense of how believable can it be? Where do we need to add in more information? There's a lot of details in here that I would want to add in that's not here at the moment, but I'm still pretty happy with the result as it is. All right, um, because I've run out of time now, I won't go into the other forms of scientific visualization, but I'd be happy to share the presentation um, with anybody who wants to, you know, uh, if, if we can share it, anybody who wants to download it, you're more than welcome to, um, uh, to watch the rest of it. Um, but I guess we might have a minute or two here for a question. Wow. First, 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 thank you so much. Amazing, excellent, outstanding lecture you have shared with us today. Lots of information indeed with the like the pictures of the species that we was working about all of this time. Today we saw that you and your team have like like produced an excellent like design and also hopefully soon we can have the animation. So thank you so much for